I just love the Analogers. I love them so much. They're always on my to brew list at all times. Even if I don't get to them um, often enough, uh, it's always on my short list of possible beers to brew each time I try to decide what to brew next. And given this winter and spring coming up, which is now here, I thought a nice late winter, early spring beer would definitely be another Vienna Lager. Uh, I, I tend to brew these in the fall a lot, I know, but I didn't get to brew one this past fall. And it turned out so good, I thought I'd share with you the recipe and how I made it in case you want to follow along and do this yourself. Uh, yeah. You can go back on my website, my YouTube channel, wherever, and find these old recipes I've made for Vienna Lager. So I might even put some links for them in the video description for you here. But I'm gonna focus on what I changed from those past recipes to make this one a little different than before, starting with the grain bill. So this time I went with an all new grain bill. I kind of scrapped my old one, started over again, read some articles, different, uh, studied some other recipes other people have done and, and why, and got a little bit more of an itch to try something a little different, a different type of Vienna lager. I still use Vienna as the, my largest percentage of the base malt, but in my old videos, the grain bill was a, just a little over half. Uh, I think I actually, this my last recipe before this one was about 55% of the total grain bill. I've increased it to about 63% this time around. Not a big difference, but it was more in the direction of the Vienna malt profile than, than less. I also replaced the Pilsner malt with my default two-row base malt that I use for all my um, most of my home brews. I have a constant inventory of two-row malt on hand, so I threw that in there instead of the Pilsner. Didn't think it was going to be much of a difference, really, honestly, um, Pilsner or, or two-row, so I just went with, with the two-row. And I replaced the Munich malt with a Carafa Munich Type 2 malt this time around. Why? <laughs> Why not? I've read good things about it being used in Vienna Lager, so I thought I'd give it a try. And I added a new type of malt this time around, a fourth ingredient, a fourth grain bill ingredient. It's a Carafa type two, and I did that just to introduce a little more color, a little darker color to the beer, as you can kind of see there, hopefully. Ooh. And, uh, and it's got a good color, so I think that was a nice addition. When it came to the hops, I switched things up a little bit. In the past, I, I've, I've been kind of partial to Mount Hood. I've always kind of just used that um, that hops for, for this style of beer. This time I used Mount Hood only for the bittering, followed up by a combination of the Hallertau Millefru and the Tettnanger as both uh, combined together as for both the flavor and aroma hops. And no complaints here. Smell, taste, bitterness, all there, all delicious. And then I really went on a limb with my yeast not really. I actually used to use, uh, I think, Y yeast, Munich lager, or some other type of uh, similar yeast around uh, that kind of strain, right? But this time around, uh, I had my hands on some Lullaman Diamond Lager yeast, and I thought I'd give that a try. And uh, I'm, uh, no complaints here. Again, very tasty beer. It's very clean, neutral um, flavor to it. Real clean finish, no real aftertaste at all. I mean, it's... To me, it's basically the perfect beer, <laughs> or a perfect beer. There's more than one type of beer style that can be perfect when made well, but um, this is a really good example of the Vienna Lager style for sure. Mm. I brewed this on my BrewEasy system, and since it's a BrewEasy system with electronic control, um, their, their little brew commander box, right? I went ahead and used that and took advantage and did a multi-step, a multi-step, uh, mash schedule. Now, I, if I was just doing batch sparging in a cooler, I wouldn't even thought about doing this, but since I have the flexibility with an electric system and a controller involved, I thought I'd take advantage of a multi-step uh, mash in order to do a couple things. First, I did a protein rest because I wanted to be able to uh, break down the proteins. I wanted them to settle out of the beer uh, a little better. And you can see I did a pretty good job there. Uh, it's pretty clear pretty darn clear, honestly. Um, so I didn't have any protein haze, and that's what I was kind of afraid of. I was wanting to try to break down that protein and try to get that kind of nibbled away at. Then I wanted a full fermentable beer. So I wanted to hit the, both the beta amylase and the alpha amylase ranges. So I did a beta amylase uh, step for, what was it, uh, 148 degrees for about 30 minutes. And then on the alpha amylase scale, I ramped it up to 160 for about 15 minutes. And for good measure, I did a mash out step, which I don't typically bother doing, but since again, I could, I just programmed it in. And I think I got the results I wanted for because this thing is very, um, it's not, I wouldn't say dry. I mean, it's a good, um, 
it's a good typical Vienna lager style beer. You know, it's got it's it's full bodied, full flavored, um, crisp and refreshing all combined. So um, I'm happy with those results. And it could be the result of this multiple step mash uh, schedule that I got such a high mash efficiency. Now, normally with the Brew Easy, I think traditionally they expect about a 70 to 72% mash extract efficiency out of my mash. This time around, I got, I think it was 77? Oh, uh, yeah, 77% mash extract efficiency, which exceeded my as design recipe uh, for of 72%, which means I had a higher gravity, which I actually diluted later with, with a little water to get it back to back in the range again. In, but uh, it was a nice surprise. Uh, I might keep up with this kind of mesh schedule on that system um, to boost my efficiency in the future too. I don't know, who knows? I mean, I presume it had something to do with it. It mashed a lot longer as a result, so we gave more time for more conversion to occur, I suppose. So that could be a big factor. Not quite sure, but I enjoy the results either way. Hmm. Oh. So that was brew day, right? But when it came to fermenting, uh, I decided to try a new fermenter I got my hands on, which is the 14 gallon version of the brew built X2 unit tank, which uh, recently just got, uh, well, made available for everyone to purchase in, in recent weeks, right? So I got my hands on one, thanks to More Beer for sending me one. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I actually have it off camera here, to evaluating it for a future review video. So if you're not a, yet a subscriber and you wanna check out that, content hit subscribe so you get uh, notified of that content when it comes around right so i used this x2 fermenter and it worked pretty well and it had had some issues that i'll talk about in that review video but i worked through them produced a really great beer it spent about three weeks in the fermenter the first two weeks fermenting at 53 degrees fahrenheit which was in the middle of the temperature range for the diamond lager yeast that i had and then an extra week that I chilled it down into the uh, mid to upper 30s in order to get a bit of a cold crash effect to settle out some of the sediment and yeast that are still in suspension in the beer. And I also did something new for the first time ever. I, instead of finding my beer uh, with gelatin finding, like I normally would to get a clear beer, I actually went ahead and bought a while back from morebeer.com. I'll put the link in the description. It's a, uh, it's a, it's a beer filter to filter your beer from the fermenter into the keg, right? So I, I went and bought this uh, beer filter system, bought a bunch of disposable polyspun one micron beer cartridges for it, and went ahead and decided to give it a chance of filtering. Uh, I was kind of in a hurry to get, get this beer on tap and I didn't want to you know, sit around with the gelatin and wait. I just wanted to clear it and keg it and go. And it turned out great. I mean, as you can see again, uh, hopefully the beer could be seen. In fact, I could see my face through the beer. Ha <laughs> Cheese! And then I kegged and carbonated it for a week. So basically four weeks from brew day to uh, first tap. And uh, I even canned, I had two kegs. I canned one keg uh, using a canner from October Design, right? And I, uh, and I actually made, made my own beer labels for that. Uh, I think it was about a case and a half or two of beer I actually uh, kegged out of that thing, or canned out of that keg. So I got one keg left on draft, which is what this came from, and a fridge full of canned Vienna lagers to take with me places, right? <laughs> Best of both worlds. And the results, outstanding. You know, I can't really give credit to any one aspect of the recipe. I mean, the, the grain bill was good. Uh, the yeast I used was great. The hops were great. Uh, the filtration worked beautifully, as you, as you can see. Uh, so there's that. And it's an all around great beer. Uh, again, great flavor. Oh man, good fizz on it because of the carbonation, of course, that's in there. Nice creamy uh, head on there, uh, delicious. I highly recommend uh, making this beer. If, if you're into Vienna lagers and you're looking for a beer to brew, uh, maybe consider the recipe I'm posting in the video link. Uh, the link in the video description for you here right now. I hope you enjoyed the video. I hope it was something for you that uh, you can go off and reproduce yourself. And do you have any questions? Put them in the comments section or reach out to me via all my different avenues of, of, uh, of Patreon or Instagram or locals.com or email. However you want to reach out to me, reach out to me. I'll see if I can get back to you in a timely manner. And uh, other than that, thanks for watching and I'll talk to you all next time. Cheers. Ugh.